Archbishop Fulton Sheen and the mystery of Russia in church history, in particular, beginning with the chapter of Fatima. As you know, Our Lady at Fatima asks for the Pope to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. I was here with my friend Kennedy Hall last week, and we were discussing whether or not that consecration has been done. And today, we're going to turn everything over to Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He's got that He's got that flair, doesn't he, Kennedy? I, yeah, I think he was trained in like uh, traditional acting. So when he would preach and do his shows, I mean, he was like a Shakespearean actor out there. He's got the cape. He does. <laughs> doing the cape. Maybe I should start doing my blazer, getting hyped up on the podcast, Fulton Sheen style. There's a meme out there's a meme out there where it's got him in his cape and it's like, I've never seen Fulton Sheen and Batman in the same room. Coincidence. Anyway. Facts. Okay. So yeah. Kennedy Hall has graciously put together a number of solid clips. What we're going to do here is we're going to let Fulton Sheen be Fulton Sheen and give his message. And at the end of the, we're going to let him go the whole way without interrupting Fulton Sheen. Let you hear Fulton Sheen. We're going to stop. We're going to do some commentary, and then we're going to start the next clip. And I think this is going to be fascinating for a lot of people because we talk about Fatima. We talk about Russia. But here we have someone who we all enjoy listening to, and that is Fulton Sheen. So without any further delay, here is Fulton Sheen in his own voice. The event itself might be called almost the birthday of the modern world. Because it was on that day that the forces of good and evil seemed to reach their peak. Our modern world, with its great crises, began on the date of October 13th, 1917. We will take you quickly to three cities and show you what happened on that day, first in Moscow, secondly in Rome, and third in a little village in Portugal called Fatima. October 13th, 1917, Moscow. Maria Alexandrovich, a young Russian noble lady, was teaching religion to a group of 200 children in the Church of the Iberian Virgin. And suddenly there was a distraction. Horsemen entered the front door, down the middle aisle, vaulted the communion rail, destroyed the icons, the statuary, the altar, and then attacked the children, killing many of them. Maria Alexandrovich ran out of the church screaming. She knew that there was an imminent revolution by the communists, and she went to Lenin, whom she knew, and she said, a most terrible thing has happened. I was teaching catechism to my children. Horsemen came in charged them and killed some of them. Lenin said, I know it. I sent them. It was one of the events that heralded at the beginning of the terrible communist revolution. All right, so that's the first clip. There. Right. So what Fulton Sheen is doing here, this is in um, a video that he did called The Man Who Knew Communism Best. And do you see the links between, um, and also he did another video called um, on, on Fatima. There was actually a Fatima movie that came out in the 50s that he was promoting. Back before there was Taylor Marshall on YouTube, they had to get Fulton Sheen to do it on TV. <laughs> now they just get, you know, the people to come on uh, Taylor's show. But um he talks about how at the beginning of the communist revolution, it also coincided with the miracle of the sun yeah. um, in 1917. And he uses this analogy of how there's a woman who is teaching catechism and sort of the horror of the revolution actually starts within the church. It starts within um, just doing awful things to the church. And at one point later on in one of his videos, he talks about how they were you know, told to shoot the Eucharist. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, anyway, it just makes your skin crawl. Um, and obviously, yes, there's a schism. And yes, we don't equivocate. We don't get rid of all the differences between East and West, but the Eastern churches are apostolic and they're valid orders and they have a real sacramental church. 
And it's a terrifying and horrific, horrific thing for something like that to happen. And um, so that's sort of the beginning. And he tells this because he's saying there's these three cities that are going to intersect, or these three places, Moscow, Rome, and Fatima. We all know the Fatima part. We're all relatively aware of the uh, Russian part, but there's a part with Rome in 1917 at the same time as this apparition um, and of this revolution beginning in, in Russia. And in the next clip, that's what he ends up talking about. If you want to say something before we go to that. No. Great summary. Let's, let's, let's hear Fulton Sheen. Sure. Oh, let's go into clip one. Clip two. October 13th, 1917, the same hour, midday. Church bells are ringing all through the city. It was a joyful event. A bishop was being consecrated. His name, Eugenio Pacelli. A man who then was not very well known, but one day would come face to face with this great revolutionary force and would become the greatest spiritual force in the world against it. Okay. All right, so he shows the par- he shows a parallel there. P- uh, Pope Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli was made bishop, and this coincidentally seems to happen at the exact same time. There's a really interesting thing. People need to understand that. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is an interesting corollary. Also, um, there's an article at the National Catholic Register, and I've read it, and it's verified. Um, Pope Pius XII, when he was setting up to declare the dogma of the Assumption, he actually had personal visions of the miracle of the sun a number of times. And um, he related he relayed this to Madre Pasqualina, who was his personal secretary for many years. Father Murr wrote an amazing book on that, uh, the a memoir of his time speaking to her for a decade or so. And um, she attested to this, and you know, many times it happened. The National Catholic Register did report on it, but there's a part that wasn't actually reported by the register. And Father Murr was talking to, I think, Robert Moynihan the other day on his Inside the Vatican thing about this. And he said a part that's not in there, but it's in the memoirs, is Madre Pasqualina essentially asked Pope Pius XII kind of, what was the point of this vision? Did you hear anything in this vision? Was there any message attached to this vision? And he said one word. Do you know what it is? apostasy. So this is so interesting with this whole Pius XII, Fatima, Russian Revolution connection here, where this bishop is set apart, consecrated, while the Russian Revolution is taking place. And later this bishop, or this bishop becomes Pope, and he is one of the only one of two popes to actually use the ex cathedral power in the way we understand it now for the declaration of a Marian dogma. And he received special visions from Our Lady about the miracle of the sun, Fatima a miracle. And in this, he is made, it is made known to him that there will be an apostasy, which he assumed meant it would take place in the church. And this is just, you know, this is on the eve of the revolution in the church, which followed the revolution of the Russian Revolution. It's all very fascinating how this all connects. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was Fulton Sheen or someone else that said Pius XII was the Fatima Pope. He was the Fatima yeah. Pope. And if you want to get the whole history of the consecration of Eugenio Pacelli and how it aligns with the progress of Our Lady's messages to the children, I put all that in my book, Infiltration, there's a whole chapter on the, sort of this conjunction of supernatural events in the life of the church. So, you know, nowadays yeah. people think about, it's, oh, it's, Benedict yeah. announced he was resigning and lightning at the Vatican. Or about, look at this, 1917. Yeah. And you look at here as a guy consecrated a bishop 
on the very day when all these things are happening. I mean, it's almost like a Mission Impossible film, you know, like cutting to different cities, you know, and all these like mm -hmm. powerful things are happening. It's amazing. Um, and and there's this myth about Pius XII being Hitler's pope. Yeah. And lo and behold, you know this, Taylor, who was that myth started by? A Jewish guy. I can't remember his name. It was a communist, though. It was Russia. Oh, okay. So it was an actual communist. It was a play. And it was fiction. Mm. And they based... So, and this was a communist propaganda thing where they made it... They had to denigrate Pope Pius XII um, as being but, Hitler's pope to But if you him. look into his life, he saved so many... I can't remember the number of Jews. And yeah. the chief rabbi of Rome... Mm -hmm. converted to Catholicism under mm -hmm. Pope Pius XII and for his baptismal name. Do you know what he chose for his baptismal name? The chief Pius rabbi Eugenio? of Rome. Yeah, Eugenio. He what chose yeah. Pius XII's personal baptismal name as his own baptismal name when he was baptized as a Catholic Christian. So if the Pope yeah. is Hitler's Pope, why would the chief rabbi of Rome be converting and taking the name of that pope? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's a hit no, job on, on Pius XII. It's a hit job. And there's even more to the story, which is so fascinating. Um, when there was talk of the bombing of Rome, uh, Pius XII wanted to stop it. So he told Churchill, Mussolini, and Stalin. Well, yeah. Um, if you begin to bomb or no, sorry, Hitler, Mussolini and, um, whatever, all of Franco. them, told, I'm getting them all mixed up. All the leaders. No, it wasn't Franco. It would have been, um, president of the United States at, at, at any rate. He said, I'm going to go out and I will go and stand under the bombs if you do this. So you will all be guilty of killing the Pope. What will that do for your war <laughs> effort? And he did it and they all missed him. And while he was out there, somehow they all missed. He comes back with his white cassock completely stained in blood because he was helping all the victims of the bombing. You can read this. Father mm -hmm. Murray talks about this. And, and after the war, the Jewish community of Rome paid to have a statue, a bronze statue, whatever it was, of Pius XII made because he was such a hater of the Jews, of course. Of course. And also, anyway, I don't know if this is apocryphal or how legit it is substantiated, but... I've heard it said multiple times that Pius XII did a long distance exorcism of Hitler. You ever heard this? No, but that sounds pretty cool. I heard I'll he consulted it. theologians and said, is it possible as Pope that I can bind and loose on earth that I could send a long distance exorcism? And so he attempted it. It's legit. Yeah. Maybe Father Ripperger can comment on that. Kind of cool. <laughs> Kind of goes yeah. back to our, our conversation last week. We we're talking about what makes the consecration of Russia valid, right? Like what makes an exorcism valid? Can you be in Rome and exorcise right. someone in Berlin? Yeah. I don't, know. I don't know. I don't know. You can't do confession through the phone because it's got to have the impersona Christi thing. But yeah. maybe a sacramental is different than the sacrament. But you can do confessions at a distance. They say if the penitent can hear, hear the voice of the priest... That distance is valid, naturally, not with phones well, and satellites. So funny story, before we get to the next clip, uh, I had uh, Father Summers, District Superior of the Asia District for the Society. He was visiting last week and he was over for dinner. And he was talking about being in Singapore during lockdown. It was, so, they actually had those dogs, those robot dogs walking around. So he's sitting in the park, hearing confessions, they were so strict on the rules. And Singapore is like ty tyrannical rule of law. Like they don't care. And um, he was sitting on the bench, you know, five, six feet away from somebody here in confession. And they see one of these robot dogs walking up to them. They have to get up and move. <laughs> yeah, because they have a little probably microphone were, on them. Yep. By the way, everybody watching, they were sitting, don't take yeah. your iPhone into confession. No. The feds are listening. Just leave it out. That's right. And and priests never take it into confession, please, Definitely. for many reasons. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. We're going to go clip okay. three. So, the, yeah. So this third clip, 
Um, he actually refers to work from Dostoevsky, kind of a prophecy about what would happen to Russia. It's pretty fascinating. Okay, here we go. I'm going to have to fast forward, I bet. Yep. Remember the young man in the land of the Gerasenes who was possessed with devils, and the Lord drove the devils out of the young man into the swine, and the swine were driven into the sea. Nostoyevsky said, that's my Russia, my beloved Russia, full of sores, putrefaction, foulness, corruption. Full even of devils. But one day, these devils, the Shigalovs, the Kirillovs, the Raskolnikovs, one day these devils will be driven out of Russia and they will be pushed back and back and back into the sea. And there, there they will be drowned, and it will be good enough for them. And Russia, Russia will sit at the feet of Christ and learn his gospel. Wow. Oh, Fulton Sheen. He was, what a guy. He's got the... Um, Shaking man, he's just mm, power. So yeah, he's the, good to go. the multiple devils of yes. Russia. I saw a meme the other day. It had like American literature, I'll die for freedom. French literature, I'll die for love. <laughs> English literature, I'll die for honor. And then Russian literature, I will die. <laughs> <laughs> just I won't die for it. Man, I'm, I will die. It's, uh, I mean, Russian literature. Yeah. I mean, I've read a lot of it. I mean, it's hits you right. I mean, it doesn't it just hit you in the gut. It kind of hits you in the gonads. I don't know how you can come away from reading, um, ah, oh, what's the book? Brothers, Brothers Karamazov. Karamazov. Yeah. Oh, no. no. What's the other one? What's the other one where, uh, uh, Crime and Punishment? He hires the, yes, Crime and Punishment. Uh, that book. You cannot come away from that book believing there is not a moral law. Like, it's just, uh, that's the whole, basically the main character tries his best to basically eschew the idea that there is such thing as an eternally binding moral law, and you just can't do it. It's just, it's mm -hmm. there. It's 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 mm -hmm. more it's more objective than anything. Um, But yeah, so what's fascinating about this, so this, people need to understand, Russia, for whatever reason, in the plan of God, has a very special place. But this special setting apart of Russia is both an instrument of blessing and chastisement. And this is to say nothing of the Russian people as being this or that. We all have problems. My prime minister is literally Justin Trudeau. I have nothing good to say about a lot of the people in Canada, okay? But my country is its own thing, right? Um, there are problems with Russia, but for some reason, Russia is to be at the heart of this purification of the world. And this is for some reason the way that God has set this apart. And think about the history, the tumultuous history of Russia in the last hundred years. We go from revolution and, you know, it's funny, if you look at the history of how Russia fought in the Second World War, say what you will about the communists, but their people were like, the, the valiant way, the courage they had to fight through that, the way it's unbelievable, the way they fought during the Second World War. They basically sacrificed themselves in order to just sort of beat the beat this, uh, the Nazis. And there's just something that they have in the Russian people. There's some sort of resolve they have that other people just don't have. And when that's used for good, it's amazing. When it's used for evil, it's a disaster. They're mm. like pit bulls. You know, they bite on something and just don't let go. It's like if you bite the wrong thing, it's a disaster. <laughs> but if you're if you're biting the right thing, it's like you're really happy they're on your team. Yeah. And they've been set apart by God for this. And we've seen this history from the revolution to the Second World War to the Cold War 
a sort of falling of communism, which they say was planned by the Russians anyway, as a way of you know a psyop for the West. Now we still have a KGB, former KGB as their prime as their president. You know what is communism really gone? I mean, in a sense, I guess. Um, and now there's this war with Ukraine, and at the heart of the global geopolitical mess once again, and it's very difficult to make sense of them. And um, in the writings of Fulton Sheen as well, Fulton Sheen talked about Russia so much. And yes, it was the time of the Cold War, sure. But it was more than that. He didn't just talk about it like geopolitically. He talked about it how the world had basically been, like Christ and his cross had been split apart by the world. And in the West, everyone wanted Christ without his cross. And in the communist East, they had the cross without Christ. So they had the discipline, they had the severity, they had the punishment, the austerity, the sacrifice, but they had no salvation. But in the West, they wanted the salvation through Jesus Christ without having to go through the suffering. And he spoke of it as these sort of two lungs of the world, when they could reunite, we would have world peace. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that Russia yeah. is key. Uh, and Russia yeah. is really, I mean, it is literally the land bridge between... Europe and the West to China, and China is another big question. So all of this is part of God's plan. Some somehow, when we're God willing, we make it to heaven, and we're in the beatific vision. We'll just be like, wow, yeah, with Saint Vladimir. It's four D chess. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Russians are good at chess. They are good at chess. Very right. good at chess. So yeah. that's the problem. All right, uh, fourth right. clip. You want to go to the fourth clip? Okay, so the fourth. Yeah, the fourth clip here is a vision Fulton Sheen had while saying mass at a massive Fatima pilgrimage. I think it was in 1950, and you'll see what he says. Perfect. All right, bring it forward. Where is four? Here we go, here we go. And now. As I stood there on that altar, overlooking that great crowd of one million people, all of them waving the white handkerchiefs as white flags of purity, in tribute to peace and to the Lady of Peace. In that great crowd of one... As I stood there on that altar, overlooking that great crowd of one million people, all of them waving the white handkerchiefs as white flags of purity in tribute to peace and to the Lady of Peace. My mind left that white square and went to the red square of Moscow where there were red flags tied red in the blood of the victims. Somehow I felt that on this day there was the great crisis between the white square of Fatima and the red square of Moscow. Somehow or other, one felt certain and secure about peace. If we could just magnify this crowd and these petitions and this spirit throughout the world. And in my imagination, I could see a great change coming over the hammer and the sickle. I could see that hammer that had beaten down so many homes and profaned so many sanctuaries. I could see it being held aloft by millions of men and looking now like a cross. And that sickle which the communists use to cut human life like unripe wheat, I now saw as changing its figure and its symbolism, and becoming, as the book of the Apocalypse said, the moon under the lady's feet. Awesome. So, this, not only is it fascinating that he believes, well, he talks about this vision of Our Lady of Fatima and the devotion to Fatima converting Russia, but if he caught that there, ladies and gentlemen, at the end, he says he sees the sickle turning into a crescent moon under Our Lady's feet. 
What does that sound like, Taylor? <laughs> the fanatic Muhammad. Sounds like Islam. Mm -hmm. And I did a video on my channel the other day with a fellow named Lloyd de Jong. His work is incredible. If you want to know the history of Islam, uh, the sort of not so secret, hidden in plain sight history. There's a huge relationship between the promotion of communism and the ideology behind communism and the political ideology of Islam that is in that part of the world. And it's not a coincidence, some would say, that the hammer and sickle flag looks very similar to the crescent and the star, if you actually look at them side by side. Um, and if we continue with these Fatima connections, the name Fatima, you can tell us a story, Taylor, but this actually is a Muslim name that talks about the conversion of Muslims away from the false religion to the true religion. And you, you were talking to me about that earlier. Yeah, you've probably heard it said, and Fatim, uh, Fulton Sheen talks about this, that Fatima is actually the name of Muhammad's favorite daughter. And so when you, when you see a little Muslim girl, just like we have so many Marys in the Catholic Church, little Marys running around the playground, they have a lot of Fatimas. In fact, I have a, a really close friend of mine. They named their daughter Fatima after Our Lady of Fatima. And they were once in a taxi cab. There was a Muslim guy, and they overheard her name was Fatima. Said, oh, you are Muslims? Your daughter's name right. is Fatima? No, we're Catholic. And the backstory is to the city named Fatima is while the Spaniards were trying to reconquer the Iberian Peninsula for Christ, there was a princess named Fatima, and she was, I don't know all the details, captured in war, something happened, and a local general, Catholic general, and she were married, well, she was baptized, she became Catholic, she married him, fell in love with him, I'm guessing happily ever after, I don't know the details after that, but in her honor, they named this place in Portugal, Fatima, after this woman who was apparently a princess, baptized, and then married to a Catholic man, and so that's why the name of Fatima, Portugal, is called Fatima, and it's interesting that Our Lady, when she came down from her throne in 1917 and visited planet Earth, that she chose of all places the hot and dusty area of Fatima, Portugal. Mm -hmm. So there is this, and we, Fulton Sheen talks about it, there's, there's going to be, through Our Lady of Fatima, there's going to be some mechanism, some spark that lights the fire of conversion for Islam. That's right. And overcomes and communism. Both that's right. cycles. And that's right. Both crescents. And two things. First thing I'll mention. At the heart of the conflict between the West and Russia has been the Middle East. Um. Afghanistan, flashpoint, okay? Uh, that region of the world has constantly been in the middle for lots of reasons, but because it's like the bridge between East and West is this Middle East, and uh, it's very ge geopolitically important. But it's also the heart of the cradle of civilization. This area of Turkey and Yemen and Iran and, and all this sort of, this, this places that we see the Horn of Africa, all these places that are linked historically, this is the biblical place. This is the place where we have the roots of creation. This is the place where we find the ancestral lands of everyone from Adam and Eve through Abraham and so on and so forth. And this place is in turmoil. And the only solution to this is conversion. It's not going to be fixed by another war or another, you know, sending policy. Okay, fine, you do things in the meantime, but it has to be through conversion. And what's interesting about Our Lady, this is there's a there's a an element, and this is why we know that the scriptures are supernatural, many reasons. But Islam, uh, as we understand it, is from about fifteen hundred years ago, fourteen hundred years ago. Okay, so Our Lady is standing on the moon in Revelation, and there was actually in that region of the world, they had an ancestral pagan worship of the moon and the stars. This was yes. common amongst the Sabaean culture, all these types. And you can actually find this in Hebrews. They reference this Sabaean um, religion 
where uh, you would kiss your hand while looking at the moon. It was a pagan act, and it's in Hebrews. It's in th- mm. chapter six, or I can't remember where it is. Mm. But he basically, Paul is saying, like, you don't kiss your hand. He's basically saying you don't do that pagan thing. So this is even mentioned in yeah. um, the I scriptures. Think the Arab moon god was called Hubal. There was a bunch of names. Okay. Um, tons of names. Hubal. Um, I've listened to this series on it. Al Makkah. All these different names are all associated with this. There's, it's all the same gods with different languages, whatever. In fact, actually, one of the names for it was Allah, because Allah means the God. Yeah. Um. So it doesn't mean God the Almighty. It just means the God of the pantheon. But in any case, so, but this is prefigured in Scripture with Our Lady standing on the crescent moon. But also, we look to her apparitions, and we can see there's a continuity between Our Lady of Guadalupe. And Our Lady of Fatima. Why is Our Lady of Guadalupe standing on a crescent moon in Mexico? There's no Muslims in Mexico. Well, hold on a sec. What happens in the Battle of Lepanto, which is going on at the same time as the apparitions of Our Lady of Guadalupe? What happens? An image, a replica of Our Lady of Guadalupe is sent from Mexico to Don John of Austria, who leads the fleet. And he has the banner of Our Lady standing on the crescent moon going into battle and winning the miraculous war for Europe against the Ottoman Turk Muslim Empire. And furthermore, the reason why, and the reason why they knew it was called Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico, is because there was already a devotion in the 1200s in Mexico, in Spain, um, to what was called Our Lady of Guadalupe, which was a, was a combination of words Wada and Lupe, the Wolf River, yep. and that statue was actually hidden because of the persecution. And guess who visited the shrine of that statue before he went to Mexico? Christopher Columbus. That's right. So you see this whole... See, I learned American this... history before it was woke. Even in the public <laughs> schools, man. We know. That's right. So there's this whole... It all converges. It all converges with Russia. This is the thing that's so fascinating. It all converges with Our Lady Fatima and Russia. And this is sort of like... This is the boiling point. This is the pinnacle. This is the the the, the final level in the game where all of these pieces come together and all the enemies of Christ, the communists, the Muslims, um, you know, the false religion, everything converges in this one sort of super enemy that we've been fighting with and struggling with for so many years. And the solution to that is devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, which Fulton Sheen yep. yep. makes clear. And you want to yep. lay, layer on another piece is in all this is very apocalyptic. That's because Our Lady appears in Apocalypse chapter 12, verse 1, check out my book, Antichrist and Apocalypse. That audible version right there is read by none other than our friend Kennedy Hall. You're going to hear his voice on there. He does a bang-up job. It's great. But yes, Our Lady is standing victorious over the crescent. But who shows up to attack her? The Red Dragon. Exactly. Okay, so we're talking about Islam. We're talking about Russia. We're talking about, in my belief, China. China. The Eastern China. powers, the red flags with the red dragon. Mm-hmm. It's all there in the apocalypse. Yep. So this stuff is real. And it's, you know what, Kennedy? It's, it's, if I could choose which century I'd be born in, I'd go first century or, or 13th century. You know, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, Louis the Ninth, be great. But we're living in a century or in time period where things seem to be escalating and we're yes. having more and more Marian apparitions and more and more things, more chaos within the church in the past, several past decades. But s- there is a culmination. Like we are, we are moving up to some sort of summit here between the forces of good with Christ and the forces of evil with the red dragon and Satan. Yeah, I believe, I agree with you. Um, and if I could offer, because I know sometimes people they'll hear, hear information like this, and then they'll get like anxious. You know, they'll say, "Oh, things are so bad." You know, but I want to read a couple words and shout out to our friend Matt Gaspers, wonderful man, and he did a work um, called Fatima Islam and Our Lady's Coming Triumph. And I'm going to read from that. So everyone can check that out online. It's available free as a PDF, as also as a talk, I think, on YouTube. And he quoted Fulton Sheen from The World's First Love, which is a great book about Mary. 
That's Fulton Sheen's book yeah. on Mary. Everybody should read it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, presently I'm reading through The Life of Christ by Fulton Sheen, and it's just fantastic. And um, he says, it is our firm belief that the fears some entertain concerning the Muslims are not to be realized, but that Islam instead will eventually be converted to Christianity and in a way that even some of our missionaries never suspect. It is our belief that this will happen not through the direct teaching of Christianity, but through a summoning of Muslims to a veneration of the mother of God. And I think that's so powerful. And he even goes on um, to talk about, and uh, Matt Casper says this, finally, Archbishop Sheen makes a crucial connection between the conversion of Muslims and Our Lady of Fatima. This is Fulton Sheen's words. Mary then is for the Muslims the true Sayida or lady. The only possible serious rival to her in their creed would be Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad himself. Since nothing ever happens out of heaven except with the finesse of all details, I believe that the Blessed Virgin chose to be known as Our Lady of Fatima as a pledge and sign of hope to the Muslim people and as an assurance that they who show her so much respect will one day accept her divine son too. Missionaries in the future will more and more see their apostolate coming among the Muslims will be successful in the measure that they preach Our Lady of Fatima. So Fatima is the key, according to Fulton Sheen, for the conversion of Russia. Fatima is the key for the conversion of Islam. Fatima will tear down the crescent and the sickle. How about that? And I will, I will add to that. Fatima is the key to the papal crisis and the chaos that's been in the church for 60 years. Yep. 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 It's all connected, man. Fatima, it's like, hey, pray for us. We're just like we love Pope Francis so much. We're just like the synod on the Amazon synod. Todo mm -hmm. es conectada. Everything is connected. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just trying to follow Pope Francis, the spirit of Pope Francis is springtime, and we just see it all connected. You know. <laughs> I gotta say, Kennedy, <laughs> have you been to Fatima? No, I have not. I went to Fatima with our NSTI pilgrimage. Everybody, check out NSTI, and. I got to say, it's a beautiful place. The stations of the cross there built by the Hungarians are glorious. Make sure if you go to Fatima, you do not miss the Hungarian stations of the cross, which also include the place where the angel gave communion to the children. One of the most beautiful places in wow. all of Fatima. You got to go there. But where Our Lady appeared is in a shallow valley in Fatima. On one end, in the, in the very bottom is the famous Fatima statue and a, the a copy of the original chapel they built with the tree where she would appear, but that tree is now dead because all the people would come and take leaves off the tree and it killed the tree. So there's a little shrine okay. there. And then up on one side of the valley is the old basilica built in the early 1900s. It's beautiful. It's traditional. It actually kind of has these two arms that come out like St. Peter's Basilica around a plaza. It's very nice. You go in there, and there's 15 side altars for the 15 mysteries of the rosary. Beautiful, wow. except they have placed ugly art over each altar that's like black, purple, brown, orange, bad, right? It makes you, yeah. it made me feel bad. I didn't like it. And then over the high altar, the same thing. So it's a beautiful church that they've put some bad art in. On the other end of that valley is the modern basilica, which has a huge cross with a Gumby hanging off of it. You know what I'm talking about, Gumby? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. And then there's this brick and a concrete Soviet-looking slab of, you know, cement. I went into part of it, I'm not a fan, but apparently there's a high altar area. I didn't even go see that because I knew I was going to get angry. It's occasion of sin. But our pilgrims told me that that whole high altar area is decorated by Father Rupnik, the Jesuit, who had the orgies yes. with the yeah. nuns. And, you know, he's got the eye art where the eyes are connected and it's kind of neo-Byzantine, but with the 70s spin. Anyway, to me, it's very sad that the infiltrators have gotten into Fatima and have touched it up 
with modernist art and architecture. And, and there's one more thing that I heard is there's this black strip down this valley area where you'll see penitents coming in on their knees, like you see at Guadalupe. It's a far away. It's hard. And the story is, Sister Lucia, when her mother was ill, she went on her knees to where the virgin appeared to her and prayed. Right? Heal my mother. So now people will make a vow for a healing or a miracle, and they will go on their knees. Well, what I've heard is that there's clergy there who tell people, get up, get off your knees. That's not what Our Lady wants. That's not the message of Fatima. No penance. So there's already this infiltration that's in Fatima, and that just hurt my heart to be there and to see that there's modernism even there. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to have you been to Guadalupe? I have twice. Thrice. Been, yeah, me too. I've been there been there twice. It's uh You've got where the I had old my basilica, reversion. which is beautiful. Yeah. But it's sinking yeah. into the earth because yeah. of the and then you've got the modern flying saucer. It's like church in the round. Yeah. It looks like spaceship came in and just landed right there. The nice thing about Guadalupe is um, the top of the hill, yeah, which is pretty high. It's like pretty hard. It's still it's still untouched. Like it, it you go into that it's shrine. Beautiful. It's not a church technically. It's a shrine, and then you go yeah. in there. It's classic Mexico. It's yeah. one half first world, one half not first world. Yeah. So you have this unbelievable shrine, and then you have these plastic chairs from Walmart that you can barely sit on if you're over 200 pounds. <laughs> it's like, it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful. And but when yeah, you're going it's, it's, up yeah. the hill, Tepeyac, as you go up yes. on your left right there is a little cemetery. You know who's buried in that cemetery? Santa Ana. Great nemesis of oh. Texas. Mexican general. Okay. He's buried wow, there. I didn't know that. Yeah. Guadalupe is great. Oh, oh. We went to we went to Lords, Our Lady of Lords, amazing, beautiful, wholesome, happy. More devotion at Lords than at Fatima, sadly. More devotion, really. Yeah, yeah. It just felt more alive, and there's more people and more singing and more candles and just more everything. More confessions at at Lords. Well, know. traditional Catholicism is traditional Catholicism is alive in France, even though Catholicism is not doing so I well. But the actual devoted Catholics are there. Yeah, the the French yeah. have a very strong traditional movement and piety. The Portuguese, not so much. Sadly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you, Fulton Sheen, for these great clips. Let's pray for the repose of his soul and, God willing, his canonization. If he's in heaven to pray for us. And um, let's continue to be devoted to Our Lady. Pray your rosary every single day or you're not on the team. You're not living the message of Fatima unless you're praying the rosary and doing the first Saturdays. So, mm -hmm. and doing penance and praying for poor sinners. So that's our homework. That's what we got to do. We got to commit to it. We got to be real about it. And um, if you missed it, check out our video we did last week on did Francis really consecrate Russia? We go back and forth on that. I think you'll enjoy that. Make sure you like the video, share it all over the place, and uh, subscribe. Hit the bell. Make sure you subscribe over at Kennedy's website, which is the Kennedy Report. He has a lot of great videos on there, a lot of good commentary. If you like the, the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast, you're going to like the Kennedy Report. Subscribe to both, cover both bases, you'll be good. And then I also want to hear from y'all in the comments. Leave a comment about whether or not you agree with Fulton Sheen and kind of us by extension. Will Our Lady of Fatima be the sign, as it says in the apocalypse, the sign in heaven that will convert Islam and bring an end to communism? What would you like to add, Kennedy? Uh, no, that's good. Just, um, yeah, just pray your rosary and also pray that the first Saturday devotions become an official. That's one thing too. They're sort of like a pious tradition right now, that's but right. they don't have the same oomph behind them officially as the first Fridays. That's so, a good point. Good point. Yeah, pray for that.
All right. Well, let's, um, yep. we'll close up. We'll pray a, a Hail Mary. We'll do it in Latin. I'll do the first sure. half. You do the second half. Yep. All right. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et an hora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Kennedy Hall with that good Latin. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Pray your rosary. Find a traditional Latin Mass. Find an Eastern rite. Find something old, apostolic, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, make sure you catechize your family. Orthodox, traditional, Catholic. Use the old catechisms. Go back and get the good stuff, that old-timey religion. And until next time, remember yeah. our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Kennedy Hall, thank you. See you soon.